Our next speaker is well known to this community. This is uh, Dr. Jeff Landis. After a uh, Sunday undergraduate at MIT, he received a PhD in, uh, from Brown University. He uh, went to work as a senior researcher at Lewis Research some time ago, and uh, now he made the transition to the dark side and became a civil servant and continues to research there. Um, I've known Jeff a long time. I made a presentation in 2014 of a concept I thought was original, only to find out later he thought of the whole thing 30 years earlier. So, <laughs> Jeff, please come. Good morning. So, Slava gave an excellent presentation about uh, why the solar gravitational lens is interesting. Now, I will do a presentation about why it is difficult. Uh, the solar gravitational lens is a fascinating object, but getting images from the gravitational lens uh, is not going to be easy. The background is something that Slava has already talked about. The fact that a massive body, the fact that a massive body deflects light is, of course, one of the classic consequences of general relativity. And because of that, it can act as a lens, and as mentioned, uh, since 1979, there have been people proposing you can use this lens. It is, in a sense, a giant telescope, a telescope that's actually an area smaller than the sun, but that's much larger than uh, actual physical telescopes. So can we use it to image extrasolar planets? Well, yes. The theoretical magnification is high enough to image not merely the planet, but to map the surface. But there's practical difficulties here. Uh, the challenge of the mission is tough. Uh, 550 AU is difficult, but it is interesting to us precisely because it's difficult. There's not a whole lot to look at this far from the sun, so it is a potential interstellar precursor. Of course, elsewhere in this meeting, people are talking about how to get there, but I just want to show a couple of the proposals uh, even back in 1987, JPL uh, did a conceptual design for this one, the 1,000 astronomical unit mission, which would go out to a distance of the gravitational lens. Uh, here's something that I like perhaps a little bit better, the idea of solar or laser-pushed light sails. Uh, here's a concept, in fact, that Greg Matloff has been uh, talking about quite a bit where a solar sail comes in very close to the sun in order to get high intensity sunlight to push it out toward the gravitational lens. Well, here's the physics. Uh, perhaps I shouldn't go too much uh, into detail here, uh, but the interesting thing to note is that because you can only image light which does not pass through the sun itself, you need the Einstein ring to be outside the surface of the sun, that puts a minimum distance of about 550 uh, astronomical units for the focus. Uh, it's worth noting, of course, that as you get further and further away, the focus is not a single place. It's not a point focus, but it is a line of focus. This is actually good in some sense. It means you don't have to stop at a point in order to focus. But if you're traveling out at tens or possibly even hundreds of AU per year, you stay in a gravitational focus as long as you're going radially outward from the sun. Well, let's see what some of the difficulties here are. Uh, the lens is pointed at a target exactly on the far side of the sun. Uh, so if you want to re-aim at a different target, say one degree away, you have to move one degree, which at 550 AU or further, uh, is a long distance. To get one degree of pointing of your telescope, you'd have to move 10 astronomical units, the distance to Saturn. What this means is essentially the telescope is not repointable. You pick your target before you launch, uh, and you are then set on that target. It is a single purpose telescope. Uh, it also means that to aim at a target far away, you need to position yourself extremely well. You're at a distance of oh, in the order of maybe 90 trillion kilometers, uh, and you need to find your point to within a distance of something like 10 kilometers just to image the planet. Here's the geometrical optics of it. 
Uh, if we're now looking at the sun as just a lens and don't think too much about what type of lens it is, it's a lens with a focal length of greater than 550 astronomical units. All of you telescope users out there know that magnification is proportional to the focal length, so the gravitational lens produces an image at a conceptual focal plane, and you can figure out how big that image is. And here's how big it is. Uh, for a, I'll use as an example a planet uh, 10 light years away. Uh, Slavo is using an example of 100, so you can do the multiplication in your head. But 10 would be the distance roughly of Epsilon Eridani, about the closest sort of distance you might want to image an extrasolar planet. So the image of the planet on the focal plane is 12 and a half kilometers in diameter. The thing to note is that this means that it isn't acting like an ordinary telescope where you have an image at focal plane imager. What it means is that the image at the focal plane is actually bigger than your spacecraft is. It's kind of the opposite. The image is no longer inside the telescope, but the telescope is now inside the image. Uh, this has consequences. Uh, so you're not imaging the whole planet. You image a small fraction of the planet, unless you have a focal plane, of course, that's many kilometers in diameter. Uh, an example case, a one meter uh, telescope um, would, uh, one meter in dimension, would image about a kilometer on the planet. Of course, that isn't what you image because of the focal blur. So imaging the whole planet would require a huge array. Well, how could you do that? Well, one thing is you could raster across the planetary disk. Uh, another might be, however, talking about things like Starshot, where we send out perhaps hundreds, maybe thousands of tiny spacecraft. Well, we might be able to just send one spacecraft out to each point in the focal plane. So we send out a thousand spacecraft, and each one looks at a point uh, on the planet. It may not be an insuperable problem. But a problem is the motion of the image. The magnification is high, and the planet is moving. The planet is orbiting. If it's orbiting at Earth's velocity, 30 kilometers a second, that one kilometer part will traverse in 33 milliseconds. Uh, but the entire diameter of the planet, more to the point, will pass across a given focal plane in about 42 seconds. So the planet does not stay in the particular place uh, for very long. If you were talking at the 100 kilometer, uh, sorry, the 100 light year distance, it would be a lot slower. It would be 420 seconds, but that's still not very long. Uh, well, what does that mean? Well, the first is you might be able to use that feature uh, because I'm saying that we have to raster in order to get the whole planet. Well, but the planet in one dimension rasters by itself. It moves across the focal plane. So now we only need a line detector in order to raster the full planet because the planet will move in the second <laughs> dimension. So it's a bug. 42 seconds is not very long, but it's also a feature. It's a feature that we might be able to use. Well, let's calculate gain. Slava gave us some information on theoretical gain at the diffraction limit. Unfortunately, the gravitational lens telescope is not diffraction limited. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, Jim Benford just mentioned one of the reasons it's not diffraction limited is that the variations in index refraction of the corona of the sun, uh, in fact, completely destroys the wavefront. Uh, the blurring due to that alone is going to uh, hurt your image beyond the diffraction limit. But let's look at the geometrical magnification. A lot of the old papers on gravitational lenses said, oh, we can't calculate the uh, focal blur due to geometrical optics because it's theoretical infinite. Well, actually, it isn't infinite. It's infinite only for an infinitesimal point, uh, but nothing is an infinitesimal point. Just a couple of vocabulary words. Amplification will define as flux at the focus divided by the flux that would have been received without the lens. Uh, gain is the same as amplification. It's usually expressed in logarithmic units, but I will flip back and forth. I'll use gain and amplification. Uh, really, they're the same thing, just whether the units are 
uh, logarithmic or uh, linear. Magnification is the area of the object divided by the area of the object without the system. Uh, turns out we're interested in area magnification, but there's a brightness theorem that says that amplification and magnification are actually the same thing. You don't increase the brightness, you just increase the apparent area. So here is a view of what we're actually looking at. This is the Einstein ring of a distant galaxy surrounding a star. And there's more of the galaxy that we can see because the Einstein ring is amplifying that distant galaxy. Here it is in schematic. Uh, we're looking at the Einstein ring and that blue ring uh, on the outside here, uh, this is the image of the planet, as was shown in the video. Uh, so at the minimal focus, this Einstein ring is exactly touching the surface of the sun. As you get further and further out, the sun gets smaller. The Einstein ring also gets smaller, but not as fast. So the Einstein ring seems to be further away from the surface of the sun. Let's look at an example case. If we're doing the 10 light year planet, the magnification oh, I should have done, is just the, era, the total area of this ring. Oh, there it is. Uh, divided by the area of what the planet would be if it weren't uh, smeared across the Einstein ring. That's relatively easy to calculate. Uh, there's the, the calculation. It's relatively straightforward. Uh, for this particular case, the Earth diameter planet at 10 light years distance, the area of that ring divided by the original area of the planet is an amplification of about 6,400. Uh, so you're getting 6,400 times more light. But there's a difficulty here. The difficulty is the solar corona. Uh, actually, I was looking at the solar corona just, uh, what was that, about a month and a half ago. Uh, I hope most of us were looking at the corona. It was actually a magnificent sight. Uh, but we'd been saying, well, the Einstein ring has to be outside of the surface of the sun, which is here blocked by the moon. Uh, but actually, if it's outside the surface of the sun, there's still quite a bit of light. Uh, so here's the corona seeing during eclipse. So the disk of the sun has to be blocked. Uh, so the first thing is we do need a coronagraph. That's going to complicate the mission a little bit. It's more than just an image detector aiming at the sun. It's an image detector that's blocking the sun itself. Uh, but you also have to block the uh, coronal light. In fact, if you only block the sun, this part, the corona itself, would be brighter than the planet. You wouldn't see the planet. So you have to be more distant than 550 AU. Here's a view of the, uh, stolen from an old paper, of how bright that solar corona is. Uh, here very close to the sun, at about 1.2 solar radii, it's actually as bright as the day sky. Uh, here actually out almost to four solar radii, the brightness of the corona is as bright as the sky when the moon is full. But actually, uh, astronomers don't usually do observations when the moon is full because they consider that too bright. You can't see dim stuff when the moon is full. Uh, but we're going to have to deal with this anyway because we'd have to go out to two times the radius of the sun, which means that you'd have to be four times the distance away. You'd have to be at 2,200 astronomical units uh, in order to get that Einstein ring separated from the uh, sun by two solar radii, that's probably too far. 550 AU is hard, uh, 2200 AU uh, is a bit harder. Let's look back and think about image brightness. Uh, as I said, you can calculate the image brightness from geometry. It's a factor of about 64,000. So that means that the one meter diameter light if you have a one meter telescope at the gravitational lens, you're collecting the same light as an 80 meter telescope uh, without the lens for that planet that's at uh, 10 light years away. But it moves past the focal plane pretty quickly in that 40 seconds. Astronomical telescopes actually don't just take snapshots. Uh, it's not like your point and shoot camera that you point, you shoot and you see the image, uh, you usually camp on one image for a long time. You take long exposures. In fact, for deep field images, 
these can even be days worth of exposure, uh, whereas the planet moves past the imaging plane in 40 seconds. Uh, so this means that since long integration times are needed to increase the signal to noise ratio, here's the noise. Uh, the signal is a little dot in there. To increase the signal to noise ratio, you want long integration times. Uh, so actually, the fact that it moves across very quickly uh, gives you bad problems with signal to noise ratio. Well, let's look at the line of focus. Uh, I showed this graph before. Every point about this line uh, is a focus. But I also want to point out that while this point is focusing all of these red lines, all of these light is out of focus at the focal point. So that actually turns out to be the definition of spherical aberration, that as you go further away from the lens, you're focusing to a different point. Uh, not sure what that ray is. But as you go further away, the focus is to a different point. So that blurs the image here. The image here is this, plus it's all of these other rays, which are increasingly out of focus. So this is a lens with spherical aberration. It's actually negative spherical aberration, because the further out points on the lens are actually focusing further away. So that gives you focal blur. And that focal blur actually is very easy to calculate. Uh, it comes just from looking at the area of the Einstein ring. But the interesting thing is the amplification is 1 over radius. So the further you get out, so you'd think, well, that goes toward infinity at the axis. It doesn't because uh, an area of, say, 1% of the area, uh, sorry, yeah. 0.1 of the radius, which is 1% of the area, uh, gives you only 1% of the light. Uh, sorry, only 10% of the light. So the focal blur actually turns out to be half the radius of the planet imaged. Uh, and that's purely due to the spherical aberration uh, inherent in the lens. So let's think about that. Although the center part of the planet is intensified relative, most of the light doesn't come from that center spot. Uh, well, the first thing you say is, well, in a lens that we use for ordinary purposes, we correct that out. We correct out spherical aberration. Unfortunately, correcting the spherical aberration would require a lens that's roughly as big uh, as your telescope. Uh, so in this case, it would require a lens that could resolve the width of the Einstein ring. But if you could resolve the width of the Einstein ring, you could just resolve the planet. You wouldn't need the gravitational lens. So the spherical aberration for our purposes is inherent uh, in the system. You can't uh, resolve it out. Well, but let's look a little bit more of the structure of the Einstein ring. I have another paper I presented at the Aerospace Sciences Conference that gives the, the math of this. But if you look at a particular stripe of the Einstein ring, what is that stripe? Well, this planet has been smeared out into the Einstein ring, but this stripe of the planet is imaged in that part of the Einstein ring. So here's this stripe of the planet is mapped to that part of the Einstein ring. So every portion of the planet is mapped onto a portion of the Einstein ring. And you should be able to deconvolute that uh, if you were sufficiently good at deconvolution. Uh, all of the stripes include the center point. So this is how it is that the center point is amplified relative to uh, the edge points, is that the further out you go, the more narrow the portion of the Einstein ring that's included. Well. So let's take a look at that. If you're not on the center of the planet, what if you're not aimed toward the center? Then this stripe of the planet now images that stripe uh, of the Einstein ring. So as the planet moves, you're looking at different stripes across the planet on different portions of the Einstein ring. So in principle, looking at different slight stripes of the Einstein ring, uh, enough information could be acquired to do a computer deconvolution uh, to reconstruct the planet. 
And I see now Slava has adopted that onto his baseline program. Uh, good, that helps. How much? Well, here's just an example, and this is again not to scale, because when you do things to scale, everything gets very tiny. Uh, but this is actually showing one arc second rings around a, a planet. So if you have one arc second in your telescope, you can get maybe 13 different slices of that Einstein ring. So with deconvolution, maybe you could get a 13 by 13 centimeter pixel. Well, one arc second isn't a particular limit in a telescope. Here's the Hubble Space Telescope, 2.4 meter mirror. Uh, in principle, it ought to get 0 0.5 uh, 0 0.05 arc seconds of resolution. Uh, actually, it gets about 0.1 arc second. No telescopes are actually completely diffraction limited. Uh, but if you could do that, you would be able to resolve about 100 points around the outside of the ring. Well, I didn't mention, but this, uh, yeah, let's go back a little. Uh, this fact that you have multiple things this is resolved, but there's an ambiguity. Uh, this slice contains light from this slice of the planet, so it contains the left and the right side, uh, and it's merged together. Since you can't resolve it, this part of the Einstein ring, which is the mirror image of that, also has both sides. That gives you mirror ambiguity if you're trying to resolve it this way. Uh, but the easiest way to resolve that mirror ambiguity is to look at the planet in half phase, so half of the planet's missing, or even better in crescent phase. So here's the crescent planet. So this stripe now maps onto this part of the Einstein ring, and there's no longer a mirror ambiguity. There is, part of it is light from this part of the planet, but that part of the planet is dark, it doesn't matter. So using it this way with multiple parts of the Einstein ring being resolved on a crescent planet, you could uh, resolve more of the planet. Looking at a crescent planet helps a little bit more. A uh, focal blur is less of a problem on a crescent planet. It's still technically half the planet's diameter, uh, but most of the planet's dark. So the fact that this focal blur includes a lot of region around it is less important because the dark part doesn't contribute. So uh, just looking at conclusions. Uh, the gravity lens can be used as a telescope, but there's many difficulties which are going to make it hard to do this mission. Uh, the required pointing is extremely difficult. You're pointing at a very small object very far away with very high precision. It means that over your distance of 100 trillion kilometers, you have to have a precision of about 10 kilometers. The size of the image on the focal plane is a problem. Uh, it means that you are now having a telescope that's smaller than the image rather than the other way around. The motion speed is a real problem. The planet moves across your focal plane so that you cannot integrate with long periods of time. You need an occulter. People haven't really looked into that problem up until very recently, uh, but this complicates the design. You're not merely looking at a light bucket but you're looking at a light bucket staring into the brightest object in the sky. When you first got your telescope, uh, when you were perhaps 10 years old, uh, the first thing they told you is don't point it at the sun. Well, okay, here you have to point it at the sun. Uh, the signal to noise ratio produced by the brightness of the solar corona uh, is really going to limit your resolution. Uh, it does not have a good signal to noise ratio. And in astronomy, ultimately, signal-to-noise ratio is everything. And finally, of course, the inherent aberration of the lens means the focal blur will be equal to half the diameter of the planet. But these difficulties aren't necessarily fatal. You can use clever approaches, and there may be even more clever approaches, uh, to resolve some of the problems. Uh, in particular, I've proposed this idea that you can use slices across the Einstein ring. That'll allow the planet's disk to be resolved, but you're not going to get that thousand by thousand pixel image. Uh, you might be able to get perhaps as much as a hundred by hundred pixel image, but that's going to be very hard to do because you'd have to use the rotation of the planet 
in order to build up the whole picture. And of course, if the planet has clouds, uh, that clouds are going to be blurring, uh, blurring everything. So the main comment is the mission's a lot more complicated than Eshelman and McCone and some of the original people proposed. It's not a case of just, oh, we go out to this distance, stare back at the sun, and voila, here's an image of the planet. Uh, it's a very complicated mission that's going to be very hard to do uh, with a essentially Hubble-class telescope sent to the distance of the gravitational lens, you might be able to get an image of perhaps as good as 100 pixels by 100 pixels uh, with a lot of averaging over the rotation of the planet. So okay. some of these uh, calculations are in this paper if you want more of the details. Uh, it was presented at the AIAA. There's an older version of the paper on archive uh, that's easy to find. Uh, doesn't have all of the corrections on it, but more of the details are in that paper. Thank you. And I should mention we'll be discussing this again this afternoon in the Sagan seminar uh, with a couple of other uh, people, experts, coming up on a panel. So we'll talk about it in much more detail. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Excellent talk. Um, you mentioned, of course, the motion of the planet. And uh, you did not mention the proper motion of the solar system mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and there. And uh, these numbers are not known very accurately. And mm -hmm. so you're having to do dead reckoning pointing mm -hmm. uh, from a place where you can't see the target no matter what. What do you do about this? Yeah. How could you acquire it? <laughs> it's true. All of the motions are important. Uh, the motion of the solar system, we can cancel out, just say, well, uh, you know, we use the sun as the reference point, but it would be the motion, the proper motion of the target. Uh, so you're going to have to have some method of doing, well, fine correction at the end to make sure you hit that uh, correct 10 kilometer spot where the planet is and not perhaps a spot uh, just a little bit off where the planet isn't. That's going to be tricky. Fine correction is mini AU. Uh, yeah, a that's a fine so, correction yeah. could be could be tricky. It's yeah. a solvable problem, but it may not be an easy problem. Just a quick one. Um, is When you get out, not all the way to 1,200 AU, but say a, a more reasonable intermediate distance between 550 and 250, um, is the corona a problem in all wavelengths of observation? Pretty much. Okay. Uh, the corona actually does a very odd thing. It has a negative index of refraction. Uh, so the corona defocuses the light Fortunately, the defocus is very strongly dependent on the wavelength, and it's almost trivial at optical wavelengths. Thank but if you start getting into radio wavelengths, actually, it, uh, there comes a point where the light isn't focused at all because it's uh, com completely defocused by the corona. Sure. Would the speed of the rotation or even the direction of rotation affect any of this? Uh, well, the direction of rotation would affect it a lot if you happen to be sort of pull onto the planet uh, because you'll never get the crescent. Uh, so yeah, it matters. Uh, but whichever way the speed and rotation is, faster it rotates, the better, of course, because you're trying to use the rotation to raster the planet uh, across the, the, the image. So the faster, the better. And the direction matters, but it's not a, it's not a main factor. It's a minor factor. Thank you.